to start, it can be overwhelming, even paralyzing. So let's fix that. Welcome to Simply Cyber, a community of tens of thousands of aspiring and active cybersecurity professionals focused on networking, knowledge sharing, and professional development. I'm Dr. Gerald Dozier, Chief Content Creator at Simply Cyber, inviting you to get the answers to your cybersecurity problems with hundreds of cybersecurity videos answering your frequently asked questions, interviewing industry experts, and live streaming daily cyber threat briefings hosted by me. Now get the stories and insights you won't find anywhere else. Hit subscribe now and dig into all the fresh content on the channel and in the community. Nothing should stop you from launching and leveling up your cybersecurity career today. All right, what's up, everybody? Good morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Today is Friday, July 28th, <coughs> excuse me, 2023. This is episode number 418 of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Gerald Dozier, and over the next 45 minutes, me, you, Jesse Johnson, Terrence Billingsley, Marcus Siler, Space Tacos, Just a Bite, Toasty Pops, Jonathan Carpenter, James Utakudo, Simply Cyber Squad members, people over on LinkedIn, people up in YouTube space, first timers, long timers. We're all going to be shredding the top cybersecurity news stories of the day. And many of us will be giving our expert opinion on what each of, <coughs> excuse me, on what each of these stories mean. Uh, to you as a practitioner, so how can we operationalize this? We'll compare notes, share tips, tricks, and techniques. And if you're looking to break in the industry, I promise you, you're going to get value from this uh, podcast every day, including today, because you're going to get exposed to terminology, concepts, um, current events, all very important. And then also the networking within chat is amazing. LinkedIn's good. YouTube chats better. Come on over here, over on the YouTube, Simply Cyber um, on YouTube and giddy up on that. Now, <clears throat> don't forget that each episode of the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing is worth half a CPE. So if you need CPEs, they stack two and a half a week, 10 a month. Be sure to say what's up in chat or buenos dias in chat. Jesus. I don't know. <clears throat> I just started taking this AG1 stuff. Ugh, God dang. I mean, it doesn't taste bad, but it like grabs your uvula and it's like, I'm going to hang out here. I'm going to hang out on this uvula and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> oh my God. Holy Jesus. Oh, oh God. And then of course, hold on now. My, my, um, Headphone has just popped out. So now I can't hear anything. Oh my god, hold on. Somebody <laughs> somebody reach underneath the desk and hit the power button, see if we can reboot everything. Oh my god. I'm like sweating now. Whew. Looks like it might be one of those shows, everybody. Alright guys, so check it out. Each episode of the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing is worth half a CPE, so be sure to say what's up in chat and then screenshot it if you want. If you're not sure what to say, hashtag team live. Let us know you're <coughs> live in chat. I see 137 of you now, but we're going to creep up closer to 300 by the end of the day. Um, if you're watching on replay, hashtag team replay. Shout out to Chris Weaver. Guys, Chris Weaver, who is sometimes T live. Uh, she's been doing a bang up job of going in and time stamping the story. So if you are team replay, I do try to, um, I, I don't try. I do it if I see it. I will pin Chris's comments to the broadcast uh, so it's right there as the first comment and you'll be able to jump around to the different stories if you don't want to consume the uh, the podcast and it's like, you know, normal flow of things. If you want to skip, <laughs> if you want to skip me choking on AG1, um, if it's your first time here, let us know in chat, hashtag first timer. Super happy that you were able to get here for the... Um, for the live stream it is it is a good time up here in live so hashtag first time i'd love to welcome those people who just found us for the first time and giddy up on it hey what's up liam it's been a minute good to see you 
Ashley, uh, good morning to Ashley. Passed A plus core two yesterday. Diving into core one after the weekend so I can get this knocked out. Boom, baby. Nice job, Ashley. James McQuiggan in the house with the super chat. It looks like you need to get some coffee in you. Happy Friday. The day we hear a dad joke. Hashtag team live. Thanks, James McQuiggan. Coffee cup cheers to you. Actually, James McQuiggan, if I can call in the lefty from the bullpen uh, and get you on deck. I do not have a Grayson joke of the day today, my friend. So if I know you've got a <laughs> a database of dad jokes. So if you could get one teed up for the mid-roll, I'd really appreciate that. And good morning to Sherry, <clears throat> one of our newer squad members uh, who found us this week <clears throat> and has been coming correct. All right, guys, before we get into the news, I want to take a minute, pay the bills and thank the sponsors for enabling me to be able to get up every morning, and choke down this AG1 and then be able to coffee cup cheers all of you, starting with my good friend who dropped a hundred spot squad membership. So if you're a brand new squad member, you might have Barricade Cyber Solutions to thank for that. Let me go ahead and t take a slug of this coffee and free up my uvula oh my god i was waiting because it's like so hot but so worth it oh my god hashtag no regrets oh god it's like fire in my chest all right <clears throat> holla 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 at barricade cyber solutions guys eric taylor casually joseph the entire barricade cyber solutions team they are dedicated to helping businesses from cyber attacks and recover <clears throat> from the damage done Cyber attacks can cause massive issues for businesses and send dedicated, hardworking business owners into turmoil. But guess what, y'all? Got news for you. Barricade Cyber Solutions. Those cats, they know how to mitigate the damage done by cyber incidents. Check them out at barricadecyber.com. Links in the description below. We just become best friends. Yep. That was for James McQuigg in Super Chat earlier. Thanks so much. Uh, Justin Gold with a 16-month squad membership. <clears throat> Thanks so much. Um, thanks so much, uh, Justin Gold, uh, longtime community member and moderator. Thank you, Justin. Uh, guys, I want to remind you about Panopsi. I got a call, actually. I got to check my phone. I got a call with Brandon, uh, owner of Panopsi, right after the stream today, so I might not be able to do jaw jacking. But <clears throat> Panopsi Security, um, they, they operate left of boom. They can help you set up a sock and everything like that. But one of the uh, great capabilities that they can deliver to a business uh, in a timely, effective way is a quantified risk assessment. Now, note I said quantified with an N, not qualified with an L, quantified. Quantified and qualified, uh, similar approaches to risk assessment, but quantified is rooted in math and evidence and statistics and base and less <clears throat> subjectivity and more objectivity. So if you're interested in setting your business up for success, if you're in charge of information security at your business, and you don't really have a plan, it's okay. It's okay, you don't have, you're not, listen, if you don't have a plan, it's not embarrassing, but you need to do something about it, okay? A quantified risk assessment can give you an objective look at your business and your security posture, give you statistical predictions on the likelihood of suffering certain cybersecurity incidents, and then enable you with <clears throat> math to be able to go to the business and ex ex you know request budget and whatnot for different things. So. Uh, don't be shy. Call Panopsi for a quantified risk assessment. Link in the description below. And hold on one second. <clears throat> oh my gosh. I do appreciate Panopsi. Also want to say shout out to Anti-Siphon, uh, but more about them at the mid-roll. Um, <clears throat> I've got to get my, uh, my, my playlist a little set up. I was kind of running around a little bit today. You know what it is a Friday. All right, guys. Do me a favor, sit back, relax. What's up, Dan Reardon over on LinkedIn? Mixing it up, you minx. All right, guys, uh, sit back, relax, and let's let the cool sounds of the hot news Fashy! wash over us in an awesome wave. I'll see you guys at the mid-roll. From the CISO series, it's cybersecurity <clears throat> headlines. It's Friday, July 28th. 2023. Millions affected by data breach at U.S. government contractor Maximus. U.S. government services contractor Maximus has disclosed a data breach warning that hackers stole the personal data of between 8 and 11 million people during the recent Move It transfer data theft attacks.
Maximus is a contractor that manages and administers U.S. government-sponsored programs, including federal and local health care programs and student loan servicing. Maximus has found no indication that the hackers progressed further than the MoveIt environment, which was immediately isolated from the rest of the corporate network. The Klopp ransomware gang has already added Maximus to its dark web data leak site as part of a big catch of 70 new victims, all having been breached using the MoveIt zero-day flaw. Two severe Linux. All right, so, you know, this is, <clears throat> you know... <laughs> Another day, another, you know, impacted victim from the move it. This, for what it's worth, guys, this isn't like new, okay? Um, the Klopp ransomware gang, they hit a bunch of people. They went wholesale um, data Excel. Like, basically, they're like, all right, guys, like, you know, order pizzas. Um, call, your, call your loved ones. Tell them you're not coming home. We're going, we're going hard uh, for the next four or five days. And that's when they did all the data exfil for the Move It. So there's probably some Move It instances. Move It is a software that allows data uh, to, to move. Like That's why it's called Move It. it data to be moved, files to be moved. And it, it could be used for good, but obviously it can also be used to move files that you own into a threat actor's database, right? So there's this massive data store that the Klopp ransomware gang has. And like Klopp is still going through all the data they got. I mean, they they went to, you know, do you guys remember? Okay, like this is going to be dating myself a little bit. But do you remember there was like a, um, there was a game show. Oh my God, I'm kind of getting it confused with a couple different things. But there was a game show with like wherever, whatever you could get like in the basket, uh, you could keep. I can't remember exactly what game show it was, but like, People would just go bananas. It was like you were on a timer. So you'd, you'd have to run and like put as much crap as you wanted in. I think it was like a kid's show. Literally, I think it was a kid's show in the 80s. Uh, I'm, al I'm almost positive. Like kid's game show in the 80s. And the kids would be like losing their mind because they'd be like, they can't hold the Atari and, you know, the roller skates and the hula hoop all at once. And they were just like dumping it in and running like supermarket sweep. No, no, no. It was kind of like supermarket sweep. But it, it was kids. I'll, I'll try to look at it at the mid-roll. But anyways, my point is, <clears throat> the Klopp ransomware gang, they weren't really looking at what data they were getting. They were like, boom, you're a, um, you're a uh, vulnerable system. Give me your data. Boom, you're a vulnerable system. Give me your data. Like, no cares. And that's why we're going to hear about move it stories every single day because people are still going through the data and seeing who's there. This particular one, not great. Government contractor, uh, that means they have access to sensitive information. They're probably into different systems. So like with a government contractor like Maximus or Booz Allen or Deloitte or something like that, um, you know, they have <clears throat> like they have clients like the Marine Corps, the Army, the NASA, not the NASA, but NASA, um, you know, Department of Homeland. Like they're, they're, like they're in everything. So that could be really bad. Also... Um, so, I mean, whatever, we'll see. This isn't good. This is a publicly traded company. We'll see what happens to their stock if their stock moves. Um, Maximus stock. Let's see if we can see what Maximus. So, um, you could see here, like clearly this is when the news was reported right here. Right. So uh, this isn't a financial channel. I'm not telling you what to do. Stock went down 5%. I typically like to think that this is a market reaction by people who don't understand and it will recover. Um, not a financial channel. I, I don't know anything. I don't even really manage my own money, but like, I'm just saying, I've seen it a million times. Okay. So we'll, we'll check back on this. Uh, Mark tape, right? 728 at 814 AM Eastern, uh, down 5% at $83. We'll check back next week and see what's up. The TLDR here is <clears throat> uh, Klopp Ransomware Move It is basically like ransomware. We're going to hear about it every day. Not much is going to change. Vulnerabilities impact 40% of Ubuntu users. Cybersecurity researchers at Wiz have disclosed two high-severity security flaws in the Ubuntu kernel that could pave the way for local privilege escalation attacks and which have the potential to impact 40% of Ubuntu users. 
The vulnerabilities tracked as CVE-2023-32629 and 2640 and dubbed Game Overlay are present in a module called Overlay FS and arise as a result of inadequate permission checks in certain scenarios, enabling a local attacker to gain elevated privileges. With security researchers Sagi Tzadzik and Shir Tamari said, quote, the impacted Ubuntu versions are prevalent in the cloud as they serve as the default operating systems for multiple cloud service providers, end quote. All right, so, um, <clears throat> oh, nice. There's a little video here. Um, Wiz, I haven't heard, I feel like I've heard of Wiz, Wiz Research. I don't know if anyone else has heard of it, but like, I've heard of them, but I, they're they're kind of new on the game, oh, like new on the scene for me at least. But this is an interesting piece of research. Not like, oh my God, like Citrix Zero Day getting actively exploited by state threat actors, but <clears throat> um, but Wiz is doing interesting research. I'm going to check them out more. Um, the TLDR here is if you're running Ubuntu, you may be vulnerable. This is a 7.8 CVSS score, so it's high, but not, you know, not check your shorts high, right? So the one thing that was in the story that kind of jumped out to me is that they said that the, ver the impacted version of Ubuntu that's running this uh, overlay module is a uh, default op. It's a it's a default version uh, in multiple cloud service providers. So if you spin up an Ubuntu and AWS, uh, hold on, uh, priceless pancake with the super chat. The show is so valuable. I've been watching less than two months and have used things I have learned here four times. My LinkedIn has tripled in value. Yes. Did we just become best friends? Yep. That's what we're talking about. Priceless pancake. Love it, love it, love it. Glad you're getting value um, from the stream. And thank you for being part of the community, Priceless Pancake. I know you're uh, contributing and delivering value also. Uh, guys, the TLDR here is um, it's very easy to spend up a Ubuntu instance in AWS, for example, right? So if you spin up an Ubuntu instance in AWS and leave it there and it's it you know and the, uh, this is a common version that's uh in cloud systems there's a chance that it gets popped you're not like it's it's not at least in my experience it's not common to be running ubuntu as a server right i mean you can and maybe i'm wrong my linux you know i know linux is a tribe all into its own let me know linux people is ubuntu the common operating system for servers I feel like when I spin up a server, I typically do Debian. Um, just and it might just be because I'm old and it's it's my default go to. Uh, but I don't know. You let me know. Uh, so the TLDR: If you guys are running Ubuntu, if you're running uh, cloud Ubuntu's, you might want to just throw this over the fence to your IT brethren uh, or sisterin. I don't even know if brethren's PC, but uh, just throw it over and let them know it's a privilege escalation. It could be bad. It's not. It's not, in the grand scheme of things, it's not wicked bad. Heart monitoring technology provider confirms a cyber attack. The website for Canadian technology company Cardiocom Solutions went down on Wednesday and remained down on Thursday following confirmation that it was responding to a cyber attack on its systems. Cardiocom provides heart monitoring and medical electrocardiogram products. It notes on a temporary web page that all of its online services were down as it worked to resolve the issue, and it provided a phone number for those in need. Representatives for the company did not respond to requests for comment about whether it was a ransomware attack, but did say, quote, there is no evidence that customers' health information was compromised as a result of this attack, since Cardiocom's software is designed to run on each client's own server environments, end quote. China accused... All right. All right. What's up, Moshi? Thank you. Striving to learn. Moshi uh, Levy with the super chat. Did we just become best friends? Yep. Uh, Moshi, longtime member of the Simply Cyber community and has a video on the channel with me on breaking into cybersecurity. So, Moshi, thanks so much for the super chat. All right, guys. So, check it out. Uh, you know, heart monitoring technology, right? So, healthcare uh, adjacent company uh, gets hit. They didn't say it was ransomware, but it might as well be. Um, I will say this for all the hubbubaloo of, you know, um, connected systems and IOT, a, a lot of in like, you know, hacking pacemakers, uh, while there is a lot to be said about, um, 
while there's a lot to be said about connected systems and you know the impact to healthcare if you go into a healthcare environment a lot of those systems are kind of like closed box systems yeah they'll have network connectivity for like remoting in but like the machines that are spinning blood the machines that are pushing drugs the machines that are like like i i don't know like i'm not saying that they're completely secured uh from from all the hacking but a lot of them are localized. So in this instance, they're saying the heart monitoring technology, um, you basically set up a server at the hospital itself and it's running that. So I, you know, I'm not a clinical facing person, so I don't know the difference between an ECG and an EKG. But what I will say is um, this is a bad look, but the, I feel like um, the, the, the headline here is all sizzle, no steak. You know what I mean? Like the company behind this technology got hit and they're down and their their cloud systems are down. Um, so some like their Gems Flex, Gems Cardio, Gems Home Flex, whatever. Those things are down, but um, the things... Well, hold on, maybe I'm wrong. So there is a slight impact, okay? Um, it looks like a lot of these apps that are uh, down, the reason they're down is because the cloud-based system's down. And typically, um, your, your device, your phone, your, your, like, you know, whatever the device is that's attached to you is recording telemetry about your heart, about your body, right? Oh, it's like, you know, 60 heartbeats a second or a, a minute, a second, Jesus, um, <laughs> heart explodes, um, and sending that data. So it's probably just queuing up the data and waiting for the server to be back up. It doesn't, it, it's, it's, it's logging data about you, not necessarily um, delivering healthcare. Now, obviously this could be bad if you're experiencing some type of like uh, heart palpitations and the device doesn't detect it because it's not reporting data. That could be bad, but um, yeah. So we'll see. I, I, in healthcare, like... The final thing I'll say about in healthcare, um, I think healthcare is, I think healthcare is an amazing environment to work in from an information security perspective, just because it's so complicated. Both the technologies are super complicated, and the people are super complicated. Right, clinical care people they don't know anything about IT or um, infosec, and I don't know anything about clinical stuff. So it's really there's like language barriers on top of everything. Plus, <clears throat> and for good reason, patient safety reigns supreme for the clinical care facing people. So they'll, they'll shove like a control, like completely out of the way. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, I've seen things where like, it's really, it's really cumbersome. Like if a physician touches you, they need to report, like they need to catalog it because they're going to bill you for it. Right. Well, that means the physician has to document in your medical record what they did because the medical records, what the billing people are going to use to uh, bill the insurance company. But the, the physician will be like, Hey nurse, put this in there under my account. So now in the nurse is not going to tell the physician no, because there is like a pecking order there. So then the nurse is like logged in as like Dr. Nick Riviera and is like typing as Dr. Nick. And then imagine bad stuff happens, right? Like they're logged in as them, which is a, obvious fundamental no-no in information security, but it happens all the time. So there's things like that. Um, healthcare, great environment to work in, a um, lot of opportunity. But having said all that, there's a lot of technology that's kind of isolated and, and, and on its own and stuff like that. Final thing I'll say, because I do like delivering, um, I like delivering extra value to everybody here. If you're interested in security research in the healthcare sector, there are two guys, um, they're actually medical doctors, like, you know, MDs went to medical school, they practice medicine, but they're into InfoSec. I think Christian Demeff, Demeff uh, is one of them. And I forget the other guy's name, but yeah, this guy right here, uh, he, um, he and his buddy did really good work. They presented at um, DEF CON. I saw them hack a... Um, like um, a, a system to report different things. It, it's, it's, it's really, really, it's really cool. Um, so if you're interested in healthcare and security research, check out Christian Demeff um, and you'll see, you'll see what I'm talking about.
Uh, yeah, why is healthcare cybersecurity so dismal? Uh, and the thing is, Christian, here's the biohacking village. This is the talk I went to. Jeff Tully is the other guy. I, the, I was at this talk. So here's the other thing is um, these two individuals, remember I said earlier, there's a language barrier between medical, doc, like clinical facing and infosec people. They live in both worlds. So they are able to do it. Plus they're medical doctors. So they're at the top of the pecking order as far as like the game of thrones that is the clinical US healthcare system. So they're able to do a lot of stuff. It's really, really, really uh, interesting stuff. This is U.S. of hacking earthquake monitoring equipment. China's state-controlled newspaper, The Global Times, reported on Wednesday that, quote, hacker groups and lawbreakers with governmental backgrounds, end quote, from the United States were suspected of compromising network equipment at an earthquake monitoring station in Wuhan. It continued, quote, according to the Public Security Bureau, this Trojan horse program can illegally control and steal seismic intensity data collected by the front end stations. This act poses a serious threat to national security, end quote. This according to the Global Times. The newspaper cited unnamed security experts who suggested the data was relevant when constructing military defense facilities. All right, couple things. One, I see Lyle Murden in chat. Lyle's another, um, we've had, you know, uh, DMs and stuff. Lyle's another healthcare infosec person. So if you got questions, immediate questions on, you know, whether or not, like the reality of healthcare infosec, Lyle can definitely comment on those things as well. All right, guys. So check this out. Uh, China accuses US. A whole bunch of things here to uh, unpack. First of all, um, and this was a great conversation. I won't name names because I, you know, sometimes I don't know if they want to be named or not. But somebody sent me, uh, or or I was in a group chat, and somebody sent the naming conventions that Microsoft uses for threat actors, right? And it's like mostly like natural disaster type things, right? So like typhoon, I think, is China, and sleet is North Korea, and if it's um. Like you get the idea, right? It's like the, this kind of taxonomy of how they name stuff. Storm, I think, is like unknown or unattributed at this time. And, and the person said, "That's interesting. The United States isn't in this taxonomy." And but 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 here's the thing: we always say advanced persistent threat, right? And and it's always like U.S. like it's almost always like U.S. based adversaries, right? So you'll never see Israel on an APT chart, you'll never see the United States on an APT chart. You will see, the only time you'll really see it is MITRE ATT&CK uh, does include equation group, which is the NSA or US. But my point is like, it, it, it really is optics and perception, but like make no mistake, the United States of America has a top tier cyber capability, right? We have, we have it, right? The NSA is amazing. Now we have Cyber Command or Space Force, um, or we have both of those actually. But um, and then Israel is like dope. Go look at Stuxnet, right? Read Nicole Pelross. This is how they tell me the world ends. Like you know. <laughs> so, anyways, so China accusing U.S. Before you like pull, like grab at your pearls and and say, oh my, I do declare. Like before you take that route, let's be real. I'm not saying the U.S. did hack it. I'm just saying there is a global geopolitical uh, cyber, you know, posturing going on. OK, so first of all, that's that's number one to point out. Second of all, I do have a little bit of interesting experience and background. Uh, hold on. Um, OK, OK. Uh, thank you. So really quickly, um, I do have some interesting experience. So many of you already know this, but like I've been to Antarctica several times. One of the times I went, a guy who was in my party, because um, like basically everybody who goes kind of goes together and you don't know who they are, what they're doing, but you just kind of go together. Uh, one of the guys was like a, he, like there, there are these systems scattered throughout the world that are hyper precision seismic monitors. I mean, they are like, they're literally designed to detect um, bombs basically. So if someone drops, like for example, let's say North Korea is testing some type of bomb and they drop one right off the coast. 
the the uh these these monitors worldwide there's only a couple you know there's probably like seven seven of them worldwide they will detect and they can triangulate because of the sensitivity of these seismic monitors they can triangulate exactly where it was when it happened how big it was all these other things and the guy at where i was he was basically he had, once a year he has to go to this thing and service it and make sure that it's still hyper precise okay so here's what i'm thinking if china's accusing the us of hacking earthquake monitoring equipment i almost wonder if two things one they are attacking it or it it would be an interesting uh military target of value if you were going to like do some stuff that would trigger an earthquake monitoring equipment and give away information so if you were going to drop some type of connecticut uh, connecticut <laughs> if you're going to drop the state of connecticut if you're going to drop some type of kinetic uh, munition which would be very much an act of war so like let's pump the brakes on that but if you were to drop some type of kinetic uh, munition it would get detected the earthquake monitoring equipment does monitor earthquakes but it can also detect other things like large explosions so i wonder if that might be part of the thing another uh interesting uh, angle is that this is industrial control system so maybe it's a pivot point a foothold into a larger system but it just seems it seems like an unusual target for a nation state like the United States to hack in and check out what's going on certainly would pose a risk to um, public safety and national security. If there was a massive earthquake in China and they didn't have any kind of like detection or warning uh, of the things that they've put in place. Um, they do uh, talk about how China, like for China to accuse the United States, they must have some evidence. You don't just go around like pointing fingers, right? Especially at that level. Um, all right. So the global times accuses the P CIA of possessing cyber weapons. Sure. Of course. Uh, China denounced the U S embassy in Beijing, the NSA. So guys, here's the deal. The TLDR China, the name of their game is espionage. The United States for all, you know, like, you know, rip, rip open my shirt and have, um, you know, uh, uh, American flag underneath, like for as patriotic as I am and stuff like America's game is also espionage, right? I mean, that's how we stay in power is through understanding what our adversaries know and what they're going to do and all these other things. So, um, this is just nation, nation state threat actor level stuff. Interesting at the geopolitical level, but day to day, this isn't going to impact you, uh, in what you do. All right, let's get to the mid roll. And now a word from our sponsor, App Omni. Over-provisioned users could lead to your most sensitive data being exposed or leaked. Just a single attack on one of those users may compromise your entire SaaS estate. With App Omni's SaaS identity fabric, secure and manage end users, entitlements, and threat-based activity. Gain visibility and control over provisioned users, the SaaS data they have access to, and receive guided remediation. Get connected with SaaS security experts at appomni.com. That's A P P O M N I dot com. Oh, all right, guys. Oh, I just burned my hand. All right, guys. It's the mid roll. If it's your first time here, I didn't see any hashtag first timers in chat, but if there are some hashtag first timers in here, we do this every day for the long timers. You know what's up. Hey, 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 hey. All right, guys, halfway through the show, we're crushing it. Good job, everybody. Friday ain't got nothing on us. Want to say thank you all for being here today. 258 of you beautiful souls on a Friday morning, getting it done, doing the work, putting in the effort before we, uh, we enjoy some well-deserved weekend time, unless you're working through the weekend. And then maybe you got the Tuesday, Wednesday off and you lucky duck. Guys, if you're getting educational value, if you're getting entertainment value, from the stream if you'd like to pay it forward and help somebody else who's looking to figure out how to get into cyber and they haven't found us yet hit the like button now hit the like button by hitting the like button a, like there's 258 people who like cybersecurity right now watching this stream believe this if you hit the like button youtube algorithm is going to say oh interesting all the people watching this stream 
They all like it, you know, thumbs up. And they all normally search for cybersecurity content. That's what they have in common. Let me go find some other people who like cybersecurity content and see if we can pump those numbers, right? Keep them on the platform. So that's what happens. Hit the like button and you're going to help other people find it. What's up, Nigel? Good to see you, man. All right, guys. Again, thanks to the stream sponsors, Barricade Cyber, Panopsi, and Anti-Siphon. I mentioned it at the beginning, but guys, Anti-Siphon training is the training arm of Black Hills Information Security. They offer all sorts of amazing training, including the pay what you can model, uh, which is a subset of all of the amazing courses they offer. Eight courses, three of them taught by John Strand himself. John Strand, he's uh, big enough to get his own emote in the emote tray, if that's any in, um, any indication of how awesome he is. Guys, uh, I attended an anti-siphon training with many of you on Wednesday around Michel Kahn's OSINT as a little taster, a little Amuse bouche before his training at Wild West Hackenfest. An absolute slate it. Um, I posted about it on LinkedIn. Um, anti-siphon training. I'm very, very honored to be affiliated with Barricade Cyber, with Panopsi, and with Black Hills Anti-Siphon Training. So, so grateful to have such great sponsors. Go check out Anti-Siphon. Link in the description below. It's one of the links that counts when you click it. So <laughs> use that link. Don't just Google it, please. Um, all right. We got the Simply Cyber Community Challenge, guys. Holla, holla, holla. Listen, the Simply Cyber Community Challenge is an ongoing initiative where members of the community get tagged. Uh, current tag is with... Um, hold on. Don't tell me. I, I, uh, I commented. Uh, Stone Arrow. Yeah, Stone Arrow... Uh, posted his cyber story. Go Trojans, right? Stone Arrow, Dakota State University's own. Um, if Stone Arrow's in chat, please, he's going to tag somebody. Uh, go on LinkedIn, uh, type, use the hashtag Simply Cyber Community Challenge, share your story. And here's the thing go find Stone Arrow's post or Stone Arrow, post it in chat. Comment on his post, and most importantly, connect with the people who post and are in the comments. What's going to happen? And ask priceless pancake because priceless pancake just commented on this within a few weeks your linkedin feed is going to be leveled up to a level that is unbelievable it's going to be mostly supportive content mostly cyber focused content it's going to be epic if you don't want your linkedin feed to be useful in cyber focus then you know stand down on this but believe me you're going to be very happy that you did this hashtag simply cyber community challenge you can search for the old posts on um you could search for the old post using that hashtag um um so stone arrow let me know in chat i'm looking at mid-roll stuff really quickly um oh my god so guys just a couple updates because i'm not gonna have time oh hold on hold on oh stone arrow let me know uh guys joke of the week let's give it up for um James McQuiggan, if James McQuiggan can please uh, step in and pinch hit for the joke of the week, uh, Grayson's own, I would really appreciate that. Really quickly also, because I'm not going to have time to jaw jack at the end, I want to say shout out to Darren who mentioned he had a job interview last week, his first cyber job. He got the job. Nailed it. Uh, Leonardo, OSCP day starts the afternoon. Woo! Leonardo, you got this, brother. Nice, nice. All right, James McQuiggan coming in with the dad joke of the day. I once worked at a keyboard factory, but I was fired. I, was putting, I wasn't putting in enough shifts. <laughs> ah, thank you so much, James McQuiggan, for the super chat best friends. Yep. and the joke of the week. Well played, sir. Well played. Uh, James McQuiggan dropping a second dad joke. Looks like it's uh, BOGOs here. Figured cybersecurity doesn't work out for me. I, would, I will be a mirror cleaner. It's the only job I can see myself in. LOL, James McQuiggan dropping heats. I love it. Uh, thank you so much, James, for uh, pinch hitting. Uh, finally, uh, Priceless Pancake says, I've been teaching my charge nurse wife, GRC, and now she's getting new responsibilities, making policies, and I'm so proud. Nice job. Nice job. Um, nice job, Priceless Pancake. And Way to go. GRC for the win. I'm on a mission. I said it last year at Wild West Hackenfest to Daniel Rowry. I'm on a mission to make GRC cool. 
at least socially acceptable, but I'm striving for cool. All right, guys, let's finish strong, and then I got a boogie. Services in the UK lost access to patient records after cyber attack. Two British ambulance services have found themselves unable to access electronic patient records after a cyber attack that hit their software provider, Ortivus. Ortivus, O-R-T-I-V-U-S, is a Swedish software company specializing in providing solutions for the healthcare and medical industry, including technology for electronic patient record systems and related medical data management applications. The company explained that the attack took place on the evening of July 18th and impacted UK customer systems within its hosted data center environment. The company added that they have no evidence that threat actors stole customers' data. All right. Couple things. One, Anna Lynn with the super chat. Anna Lynn, great to see you. Did we just become best friends? Yep. It's been a minute, Anna. Uh, great to see you, though. Uh, always been a longtime supporter of the, the channel and the community. So cer certainly appreciate that. All right, guys, it's another healthcare related one. Um, listen, in the world of healthcare, again, I said this earlier, it's super complicated, but you need an electronic medical record, electronic health record, whatever you want to call it. Basically, a record that is reserved for capturing your health data. Okay. And I'm not just saying like your blood type and stuff like that. In the United States, at least, I'm sure it's similar in um, developed countries. Anytime um, a clinical person touches you, okay. And, and, and I'm using touch very generically, right? Like anytime anything is done for you, whether it's like multiple people, um, multiple physicians, nurses, whatever, anytime they're touching you, they have to document it in a medical record. So there's like a clear line of what has been done to you and what has not been done to you. Um, so those, those records become vitally important. And like, dude, there are companies, Cerner, Epic, there are companies that are like printing money because they have these large EHR implementations. Okay. Now, smaller healthcare practices aren't going to be able to afford multi million dollar EHRs. So there's like this industry of kind of like cloud based EHR uh, services for smaller businesses, et cetera, right? I, I would imagine Ortivus is one of these. Long story short, cloud based EHR, they suffered a cyber attack. The clinical, uh, in this instance, ambulance services would use them and lost access to the patient records. So they said no patients have been harmed. I would, I would put an asterisk next to that and say that's interesting spin. No patients probably have been harmed, but think about this. I suffer um, a heart attack, right? I'm unconscious. I'm allergic to penicillin. I'm allergic to whatever, or I'm taking some medicine that would have a nasty reaction to something. Ambulance shows up. They look at me. They're, they stabilize me. They go to look at my medical record and it's inaccessible because of a cyber attack. And then they hit me with some drugs that's going to be a problem, right? Now I'm impacted. That isn't, that is like, a, uh, it's tangential to the fact they couldn't access my medical record. It's not like the medical record uh, had an integrity issue where it said I was not allergic to those drugs. So you could, you could spin it and say, well, it wasn't it, like not being able to access the medical record didn't mean that you were supposed to give them those drugs or not give them those drugs. So I feel like there is some opportunity here. Again, that's speculation and kind of a, um, I wanted to provide a example on how it could be impacted. I'm not saying that's what did happen. Um, they're using manual procedures, which is standard. All hospitals, um, and I'm sure ambulance services, they call it downtime procedures. You have to be able to deliver patient care like in a blackout, right? So you can't just rely on technology. If that was the case, um, you know, clinical staff would just be computers. Hopefully they get back up. Um, it's not good. Um, and, you know, ultimately, I'm glad that no patients were harmed in this instance. But at the end of the day, guys, <laughs> ransomware threat actors, they don't care. I said this, I forget where who I was talking to or what, what I was on. Ransomware threat actors, they don't care. They'll hit a, com a healthcare company. They'll hit a small business, a big business, financial, lawyers. Like they don't, it doesn't matter. You know why? Great cash, homie. They just want to get paid. That's it. That's it. They're trying to find the quickest path to getting paid. New malvertising campaign distributing Trojanized IT tools via Google and Bing search ads. 
A new malvertising campaign has been observed leveraging ads on Google Search and Bing to target users seeking IT tools like AnyDesk, Cisco AnyConnect VPN, and WinSCP, and then trick them into downloading Trojanized installers with an aim to breach enterprise networks and likely carry out future ransomware attacks. Dubbed Nitrogen, the opportunistic activity is designed to deploy second-stage attack tools such as Cobalt Strike, according to Sophos, reporting in an analysis on Wednesday. They continued, quote, throughout the infection chain, the threat actors use uncommon export forwarding and DLL preloading techniques to mask their malicious activity and hinder analysis, end quote. Swiss. All right, guys, you can have this, you know, I'm going <clears> to... <throat> I need, like, if you've been on the show regular, you know that I, for some reason, I could probably uh, do an introspection and, and, and understand why, but I have a real soft spot for infographics, okay? I just, I love, I do love um, visually communicating large amounts of information in small amounts of um, space. Check it out. Dude, the, the TLDR, this is a great one for your end users. Carl's going to know. <gasps> Carl's going to know what's up, guys. Yeah, we can, like, everything, listen, this this flow chart, everything underneath here, so the first bubble is the only one we care about. Everything else under here is really, really fun and cool for us, but um, for left of boom, for GRC people, let's focus on this bubble at the top left. Malvertising through Google Ads, Bing Ads. Guys, threat actors are well-funded. They'll buy some some ads and then replace, like, you know, the Zoom client, the Teams client, the WinSCP client, whatever, whatever it is. You you trick, you get your result at the top of Google or Bing search. Some, you know, you know, unknowing victim clicks on it. They get a fake branded website. So it looks real. And then they download it. And yeah, pop-ups. Hey, this looks evil. Hey, are you sure you want to install? Yes, 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 yes. Click, 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 click. And you're basically, you know, as a victim... You're installing not what you think you're installing. You're literally just going through and installing all the bad stuff. Now, if you're a real fancy pants, you make it like a Trojan. So the actual like WinSCP or Zoom client actually works, but you've bound some type of malware inside of it too. So um, anyways, if you want, now we can get into, if you're a SOC analyst, if you're a detection engineer, you can get down here and look at all this stuff. It drops Cobalt Strike beacons. You know, Cobalt Strike is a, a post-exploitation framework. It's a really popular one. There is an at, ooh, there is a buttload of detections for Cobalt Strike. That's why threat actors are actually moving away and going to um, Sliver and, um, oh my God, there's another one that's like super popular right now. But anyways, Cobalt Strike's gonna work if you're, if, but if you're looking for it, if you use the well-defined detections, uh, there you go. And you can also look for C2 traffic, uh, command and control traffic to threat actor controlled servers and stuff like that. But because, again, since I'm super GRC biased, if you can get in front of Carl, right? Carl! If you can get in front of Carl and educate people not to click on the stupid link in the first place, you don't have to go through this whole flow chart because you can you can interrupt them right here at the top one. You feel me? All right. And if anyone's got a problem... Catch me outside. <laughs> I actually just wanted an excuse to play that sounder. Visa appointments cancelled in the UK due to IT incident. As of yesterday, Thursday, all appointments for people in the UK looking to obtain tourist and transit visas to Switzerland have been cancelled. TLS Contact, Switzerland's chosen outsourced provider of visa and consular services, is blaming, quote, an IT incident, end quote, at its London, Manchester and Edinburgh centres for the cancellations. TLS Contact provides visa processing and IT services to several governments with 150 visa application centres and a presence across 90 countries. All right. Australia? Uh... Let me just see. All right, so this is an outsourced service. The go the Swiss government has outsourced to some, you know, entity TLS contact to provide visa services. No big deal. Um, I mean, it sucks if you're actually impacted. Say you had like some big Swiss trip coming up and you can't get a visa. Obviously, 
I would say, you know, this impacts a small set of people. Um, you know, people who have submitted very sensitive information, passport, biometrics, um, PII, that is probably compromised. I, I didn't catch whether or not they mentioned, uh, someone was DMing me some really interesting, exciting stuff. Um, so some PII was getting, you know, probably compromised. It says due to a technical reason, it didn't say cyber attack. So it could just be a, yeah. Okay. So check this out, guys. The one thing I'm going to say about this, there's two things here. One, third party risk, right? So the Swiss government outsourced this to some company. Um, it goes down, there's a problem, right? So do you either have like downtime procedures? So like, how could people get visas if this thing goes down, at least in a, you know, kind of a disaster recovery business continuity situation. That is a decision for the business. Like, is it important enough to make sure that people can get visas at any time, no matter what? Yes or no? If the answer is no, then guess what? That's not a critical business process. And I'm being a little flippant and generic here about Swiss Switzerland as a company and visas as a process. But think about it, guys. When we are doing a business impact analysis, and actually, let, let's talk real truth for a second, okay? This is a the more you know kind of moment. When you talk um, about you know what's critical here, what critical applications are there? What business processes are critical, right? Everybody is going to say whatever their thing is is critical. Okay, so first of all, you're not going to get people will be honest with you, but that doesn't mean that it's actually critical, right? So whoever's in charge of like visas and tourism at the, in Switzerland. Um, is probably like, oh no, the visa process, super, super critical, you know, but if you ask like the president or the executives, right, again, like to, to make a comparison between business and, and this, um, they might say no, like it's not, it's not critical. And here's the deal. If it's critical, okay, yes or no, is it critical? If the executives, if the, 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 the leadership in Switzerland says, yes, it is, well, that means then that you need to invest money, people, and time into making sure that you have business continuity in case something like this happens. Whoa, 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 whoa. We already pay quite a bit for the solution it is now. We're not going to pay more for a backup solution. Well, then, madam, may I point out then that it's not critical. That is not critical then because you're not willing to invest in a business continuity solution. Right. And by the way, it doesn't have to be a bolt on server rack and stack solution. It's just whatever the solution is, downtime procedures, you send them to the embassy, have paper applications. I don't know. But my point is, it takes time and process and people to have a backup solution, whatever it is. So if you say it's absolutely critical, and then the next thing out of my mouth is, okay, if that's true, then let's put in business continuity. And you're like, well, it's not that critical. It's like, bro, you can't have everything be critical because then nothing's critical. You feel me? And this is something that you will, in, as a C, like if, if you're GRC, you eventually will get to this point. This is more of a senior thing, but you're going to encounter these situations where like, Everything's important. Every application's critical until it becomes the next step of all right. Well, let's account for it. Let's let's handle it. And then people are like, uh, actually no. And then, and, but th those people scurry away, right? So, um, just just so you know. All right. Also, third party risk. Like you know, obviously, uh, I would imagine that you're going to have some type of contract in place with this third party on services, five nines availability, et cetera. Welcome to the lecture. So that was my GRC, the more you know. The Medical Association calls for stronger AI regulations after doctors use chat GPT to write medical notes. Australia's Peak Medical Association has called for strong rules and transparency around the use of artificial intelligence in the healthcare industry after a warning to doctors in Perth-based hospitals not to write medical notes using ChatGPT. Five hospitals in Perth's South Metropolitan Health Service were advised in May to stop using ChatGPT to write medical records for patients. 
The Australian Broadcasting Corporation reported that in an email to staff, the service's CEO, Paul Forden, said there was no assurance of patient confidentiality using such systems and it must stop, and that AI protections should include ensuring that clinicians make the final decisions and that there is informed consent by the patient for any treatment or diagnostic undertaken using AI. <laughs> All right, here we go. You are so dumb. You are really dumb. For real. Shall we play a game? Oh my god. Okay, so... Uh, <laughs> First of all, Funky Monk, apologies. I will note, I don't know if Eastern Australia and Western Australia are at odds with each other. This is in Perth, which is like, as far as I know, it's like the only thing going on in Western Australia. And there's like a vast wasteland between um, Perth and like, you know, Brisbane. Uh, it, uh, if you've ever read um, Stephen King's The Dark Tower series, the first book, I think it's called Gunslinger. Uh, basically, I, I won't get too into the details, but I always think that like that that entire book takes place in the midsection of Australia. If you've read the book, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so here's the thing: Th their response here, the, the the physician's response is, "Well, we didn't put p um, patient information into ChatGPT. That's not the problem, you donkeys. Listen, yes, you should not put sensitive information of any type into ChatGPT unless you have some type of private instance. And even if you do, you should not put uh, people's personal information into this thing. Second of all, bro, ChatGPT hallucinates all the time. So if you are going to just like dump a bunch of information in and then copy paste into a patient medical record, actually, they had to have put PI, uh, a patient medical record in uh, sensitive information in here because they probably said like, I administered this drug, I did this, write this as a physician would have to do for medical notes in order for it to be acceptable by billing. This whole day's stream has been healthcare focused and talking about EHR and the the modern healthcare system when it comes to patient, uh, you know, clinical patient delivery and the billing of those services. And the medical record is ground zero for all of that stuff. So for them to write, uh, use ChatGPT, this is embarrassing. This is kind of right up there where the lawyer uh, had like a court notes or whatever, where he had an argument that had a bunch of court cases that were cited that never existed, ChatGPT made up. This is wicked dangerous, guys. You could get in into an instance where ChatGPT says things that didn't happen. So now your official medical record includes clinical care that you never received. You could get billed for things that didn't happen, which could be outside of your insurance, which then gets rejected. And now you've got to pay for some service that you never even uh, received. On top of that, with all due respect, I'm not clinical. Like if I got some bill for some service, how the hell am I supposed to know if I received it or not? Unless it's like, you know, whatever, like... Uh, put a band-aid on for a skin knee like i know what that is but if if they like open me up and they're doing like internal organ surgery or something i don't know what they're doing i don't know who has to be involved with that this is not good and yet and, and like again this is why i'm losing my mind and about ai regulation and why I'm really happy about yesterday's story and like the the you know the Microsofts and the Googles are actually getting together and have a AI frontier committee or whatever the hell whatever it is sorry um to coordinate with the White House on AI regulations and safety going forward and I rail against the Senate putting together like a special commission panel that might meet in October or November to start talking about AI this thing is moving wicked fast People are using it. It's super accessible. This is a scary use case and shame on these physicians. Like I get it. It sucks. You want, you got into medicine to deliver uh, patient care and you love it. And you spend 90% of your time typing on a keyboard because you have to document it for the medical system. Well, guess what? Take a portion of your salary and hire a scribe. There's an entire, e uh, there's an entire job of people who literally stand next to the doctor and type in the keyboard for them, right? If you if you want, hire a scribe. It's a job, okay? But do not do not outsource it to ChatGPT. Jesus. Shall we play? Oh game? my god. I don't like I don't know why it's triggering to me, but it's like you should know better. It's lazy. Okay? It's one thing. It's one thing if you 
so it's one thing if you like ask ChatGPT to like write something, then you take it out and clean it up, make sure it's factually accurate. Use ChatGPT as like a draft, right? And then you make it your own. Fine. You cannot stick sensitive information in there. You can't put other people's health information. You sure is. You sure can't copy and paste it into a medical record and something as important as somebody else's medical. It, it's, 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 it's unacceptable. It, like you could, you could really, you, it's, it's, ugh. all right, that's going to do it. I'm like sweating up here now. I'm so mad. Um, all right, guys, really quickly. Cause I got to go, uh, I got to go get screened for TSA pre-check. Um, if you guys didn't know, um, I'm launching a new channel um, officially uh, in September, but I'm doing a soft launch right now. If you're interested, come check it out. It's called the SC Cafe. If you think about Simply Cyber, um, I do a lot of content that's like professional and useful for you being a practitioner, getting into the industry. And then I have some content that's a lot more relaxed and a lot more casual. Um, so it's, it's big enough now that I need two different channels. I need um business up front which is simply cyber which you're on right now and party in the rear which is sc cafe so think of simply cyber as a mullet right we got the business up front party in the rear come join um i i don't have any content on there right now except a little teaser video but it's the casual side of cybersecurity. come come join come check it out uh more information to follow in the coming time i want to say holler to um Gabe Lister, Gabe Lister, uh, who picked up the Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Gabe, thank you so much for picking up that challenge. I look forward to your post. Guys, uh, no jock jacking today. Um, I've got a I've got a 9 a.m. meeting with Brandon Poole from Panopsi, and I've got a boogie over across town to get to a uh, uh, TSA pre-check thing so when I go to Vegas, I can boogie through the line. I am definitely not going to grow a mullet, Paul Savage. All right, guys. Thank you all so very much. I'm Jerry. Oh, is Neil Bridges doing a um, stream right now? Hold on one second. What? Oh, my God. Do you have a link? Thank you. All right. It looks like Neil Bridges is doing an AMA right now. All right, hey, let's go over and raid uh, Neil Bridges, please. Raid. Do me a favor, hashtag Simply Cyber in chat when you go over there. Simply Cyber raid. Let's raid Neil. All right, everybody. Oh. Oh, my God. I got to log in to do this. I'll do this off stream. Can I do this right now? Hold on. I, I want to do it. Uh, I think it's this one. Oh, multi-factor authentication, bro. Hold on one second. Raid, raid, raid. Here we go, raid. Good luck, Leonardo. All right, there we go. Get your raid on. Get your raid on, everybody. Leonardo, good luck with OSCP. We'll see you. Be good, everybody. Have a good one. Take care.